morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, June 27th, we are studying Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. In today's text, a sleepless night for the king leads to some light reading, which leads to honor given for a forgotten act of kindness. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Andrew Belt. Pastor Belt serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks for having me on today. So we get started today, Pastor. Give us some context in the book of Esther. What should we know about this book and what's been happening leading up to chapter 6? Yeah, so Esther is one of those you know post-exilic books that tells us the life and times of the people of God after their exile. And in, this, in case of this book... You know, a long while after they've been allowed to return back home to Jerusalem and all of that. Uh, so this, uh, the context for Esther, right, takes place in the, in, in the diaspora, right? The, the Jews have been scattered across the world. Some of them have returned home. But in the case of Esther, and as we see Mordecai, they're still in Babylon. They're in Persia, right? They're, they're still spread across the nations. Um, and so we see they're kind of their, the trouble that they're in because living amongst the nation, not being their own kind of a you know, secure in their own nation anymore. Um, there's kind of a, a life uh, that they have to live without that kind of security blanket that came from being a part of the kingdom of God, you know, and living under the king of David and, and all of this uh, with their own laws and their rules. Now they're kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of at the mercy of the nations around them. And so as we've seen in the book of Esther, <clears throat> you know, Mordecai, they have been living in, under, you know, the Persian king, and as they go forward, right, there's been a plot that has been hatched by Haman, and he's looking to destroy all the Jews. And, and Esther, during all of this happening, right, Esther has kind of ascended onto being a queen, um, chosen after Vashti is deposed and all of that. And, you know, Mordecai, he's saved the king from a plot. Uh, so in the book of Esther, we're going to see, you know, we see a lot of plotting. Um, we see a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a, a lot of details come together, kind of uh, coincidences and things like mm-hmm. that, um, that you can see that God is definitely driving the action of the book, even if he's not a, a named character, a named person in the book himself. Um, and so it's kind of a delight to see a, a plan that happens that then gets reversed. And we're going to see some of that reversal happening in our text today from chapter 6. Um, but, you know, a lot of fam- old family rivalries are going to come up here, some old blood um, things like that too in the book of Esther that kind of uh, you know calls back to some things earlier in the Old Testament. Um, it calls back to a lot of Psalms that we read. You know, with like, you, know, you can think of uh, you know Psalm seven. You know, with the enemy's plan backfiring against them. You know, boomeranging. They have this plan, the evil, but yet it comes back on their own head. You know, the book of Esther is full of these kind of surprise delights um, and overturns and and the plan of the enemy going awry. Uh, this so it's a lot of fun that you can find in the book of Esther. Talk a little bit more with the book of Esther at large. The, the fact that, that you said, you know, what seems like coincidence, we see the direction of God. As we've noted previously in, in studies on Esther, you know, God is not explicitly mentioned in this book. Uh, talk a little bit more about that reality and, and how that's actually an important thing in this book that we should take to heart and, and draw theological implications from. Yeah, so, you know, when we see in the book of Esther, and that sometimes uh, it maybe unnerves people as they, you know, some scholars, you know, always unnerves scholars. Um, but they will look at this book and be worried because, you know, God is never referenced. Neither are there really any, um, you know, major religious kind of connections made, you know, prayer and things like that. Th- right. These things are largely kind of absent from the book. And a lot of people, you know, speculate, why is this? Well, you know, it should, you know, maybe that's why Esther shouldn't be a part of the canon, right? Some of the, some discussions are made on that. Um, but what we see in this book is a lot of callbacks, and like we'll you know, kind of spoil a little bit here today, you know, when we see the king restless and not able to sleep at night, right? Also, in my mind, goes back to like Pharaoh and the book of, uh, the book of Genesis having terrible dreams and, and not knowing what to make of it. And, and all of a sudden, God is using that to elevate Joseph or, 
uh, as in Daniel, right? And you'll see the king, he's having his, the same things like in Genesis. And Daniel's there and he's able to interpret the dream that God has his people and, and the pieces all together there. And when it all comes together, you see that this wasn't just happy coincidence or just sheer luck, but that this is, has been driven by God. Um, and you see that earlier in the book. So when we come to Esther and these things are perhaps so noticeably absent, um, right? We still see all the pieces there, but yet we don't get a mention of God. We, we know from our background, like, oh, this is, you know, God driving the story. It's almost like we don't even need him being named because we know how it all just plays out. Uh, and in that sense, you know, Esther and a lot of the writing, you know, you get this a little bit more so in Ruth and the other, you know, what we call the, the writings. Um, you get this, at, like, God is not profoundly from his perspective, right? Like a lot of the other books, we get God's inclusion, um, God's perspective on the things. Um, but yet here in this book, we get really just a basic human level on things, which is how, you know, you and I mostly encounter the world, right? Uh, also, I don't have the Lord said, uh, this is going to now happen. And, oh, okay, that tells me a lot, right? I, get, I go through my day and I see how the Lord is directing and guiding and things like that without him really being, you know, explicitly present, you know, to put it that way. Uh, we see that in the book of Esther. He's not named, but that doesn't mean he's not working or operating or turning the tables as he is so off to do in the scriptures. Um, so I think almost the absence drives home the point of his presence a lot more than probably just trying to put him in there. You know, if you want to use your Greek uh, Bible, you, you can have some of those things put in. But um, sure. yeah, it's, so it, I think that's kind of a brilliant literary device in that way for the book of Esther. Uh, and as we'll, we'll, we'll encounter today, we're going to see that point blank that uh, when God, you know, when people are not given sleep or they're having trouble sleeping in the rest of the Bible, we see God is usually at hand working in this. Yeah, and I think what, what you're saying there about the, the seeming absence of God actually allows us to see his presence all the more is helpful for us in our day-to-day lives in which that seeming absence of God can help us then to recognize his his presence all the more, not in, however, an enthusiastic way in which we find God apart from his word or sort of try to figure out precisely what he's up to. And that's one of the things I really love about, especially Esther and Mordecai, as they act throughout this narrative, is that they're not really trying to figure out what God is up to. Rather, they examine the situation that's before them, using the the wisdom that God has given them, and they seek to respond faithfully to that situation that that has been put in front of them, using that wisdom that God has given them, according to His Word. And so they're, they're not... There's not a, a constant rec- or like a constant trying to figure out, okay, what's God doing here mm. and what's God doing there? There's even Mordecai says, who knows whether or not this has come for such a time as this, right? Well, I don't know, but I know here's where I am, and I know this is what faithfulness looks like. So that's what I'm going to do. And and really you can only do that if if you are confident that God is there but there's not that like hand wringing where like what's God going to do I don't know and and that leads me to to not act rather the fact that I know God is there even if I don't know exactly what he's up to enables me to act confidently in that moment according to the word that he's given as to you know what my life should look like as a as a, a Christian person and so I and I, we're not going to see that reality as much in our particular text today but I, I do think you're right that's a, a feature of this book that helps us to to live faithfully when we don't know exactly what's going on yeah and you know I think we see this a lot in the post exilic books too um, you know the people that come back from exile are not like their fathers. Um, you know, who are stubborn and rebellion. It, they have their own sins, right? They have their own problems that they, they fall into. But they are a people that are like, we desire to be faithful now. And, and so they're looking back at the written word. They're looking back at the prophets and saying, they were right. They're looking at the Torah, the, Moses, or the books of Moses, and like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what we should do. And, and so as we see in the book of Esther and, and Ezra and Nehemiah, um, these people desire to be faithful to the people that... Uh, to the situation in which God has called them into. Um, you get that in Jeremiah, right? You're going to go off to Babylon, and guess what? You're going to build homes there, and you're going to live there, and you're going to seek the well-being of Babylon, and yet you're still going to be faithful at the yeah. same time. Uh, and I think you, you see that theme really playing out in all the post-exilic books. What does life look like for God's people to be faithful, especially living in 
Babylon, even if it means that they're still in the promised land. They're still ruled by Babylon. And you see that even in the New Testament, right? They're ruled by the Romans. And what does it look like to be a faithful follower of the Lord um, when you're under foreign domination, right? Living under God's kingdom. So I, you, know, you see a lot of these uh, situations that kind of come to bear in the New Testament um, that kind of come to the, the knife's point. And you see all of that kind of building right now. Um, in these books, which is kind of fun. As you say, you know, we, we often don't focus a lot on these books, uh, but that really helps lead us into the, the hope when we get to the New Testament that the king, the son of David, has returned. Um, and there's a lot of joy with that. That's right. That's right. Now, in our, in our chapter for today, this is one of those, those chapters of, of God's Word that I think we're allowed to chuckle to ourselves occasionally hmm. here at the way that the Lord arranges things and, and brings things to bear. Again, we're not going to see so much the, the faithful actions of Mordecai and Esther. In fact, this is almost, there's not a ton of things that really happen by human direction in this chapter. It's, it's almost a, there's just a series of ironic, somewhat comedic twists in this chapter that begin to reverse things that have been happening in the narrative, such that we can really start to see where the, the text is, is going. Remember, at the end of chapter 5, the last thing that we've heard is Haman has been very joyful, except for one thing, Mordecai remains there at the king's gate unpunished, and the counsel that he's received from his wife and his friends is, go ahead, make this really tall gallows so that Mordecai can be executed tomorrow morning so that you're able to go to Queen Esther's feast joyfully that evening. So we're we're right there. We left with a cliffhanger at the end mm. of chapter 5. What's going to happen on this gallows that Haman is in the process of building? Will Mordecai be executed or not? And now the text is going to return us to the king and whether or not he can sleep. So... Esther chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. That's our text for today, Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. So, Pastor Belt, the text starts with a sleepless night for a king. You mentioned previously that there are some parallels that this might remind us and, and again, give us a clue as to how God is at work here, even though he's not explicitly mentioned in the text. Uh, talk to us about this sleepless night. Yeah, so in the scriptures, right, there's no coincidence. There's no sheer chance. And, and here we're going to get like almost a coincidence after coincidence after co you know, It's just all these are going to build up. You see that, that almost like there's a missing actor. 
in, mm-hmm. in this chapter. You, you can tell that someone's at work behind the scenes making things go as they need to go here. And all of it just adds up um, to the stunning reversal here in, in this book and this chapter. Um, you know, it begins with the king. He can't sleep. And in the Bible, when the king, when a king can't sleep, you know something's up, that God's at work here. You know, Pharaoh in the book of Genesis, uh, the king in uh, Xerxes, you know, Xerxes with the uh, book of Daniel there. All right, so as we see these kind of kings line up, they're sleepless nights, they have these dreams that bother them. Um, we know that something's at play here. Something's about to happen. God is causing, you know, he's, he's moving the pieces. Uh, in the book of Psalms, you know, you get this idea that a, a sleepless night here, the Lord is calling people to prayer. Uh, the early church often saw that too. When, uh, God, when you can't sleep, it's mean God is keeping you up because he wants you to come in with prayer. Um, and, and so you, you, you got to wonder here you know, that the king is, is having a sleepless night. What, what's going to happen next? Right? If we were kind of you know, approaching this text with a blank slate, right? often you know, we, we've read it before, we know the story, we know how it goes. But if we kind of let the, the twists and the surprises catch us, I think this text kind of pops out and comes to life a lot more. Um, and so, of course, you know, the king is sleepless, so what better way to be put to bed than, hey, have the royal records brought in? You know, it's, uh, uh, I told we recently in our congregation, we, we updated our constitution and bylaws, and we had to read them. And so I said, put this by your nightstand, and when you can't sleep at night, pull it out and read it, and hopefully you'll go to bed. Um, all right, that's kind of the situation here. He's, uh, he's looking to go to sleep. He's having trouble. What better way than maybe if he hear, maybe he's heard these before and it's put him out. And uh, now he needs these brought in and read to him, a good bedtime story. And uh, it's just comical. It starts off with kind of, <laughs> kind of a little bit of a chuckle here. Sure, sure. This. And just the, I mean, again, thinking about, as you're saying, the, the twists and turns of the narrative, the surprises, the, the fact that we've gone from, you know, very momentous events within the text. You go back into to Esther 3, where Haman first hatches his plot, and then into Esther 4, where that plot is now made known, and and Mordecai is you know, mourning at the king's gate, and there's this really heavy conversation between Mordecai and Esther as to how they need to act at this moment, and particularly what Esther needs to do. And the great danger that Esther has put herself in in chapter five when she went before the king without being invited. And that, you know, that maybe that sense of relief then that was there when when she was not killed, but she was spared, and the king has continued to to grant her request for these feasts. And now we've heard of Haman's plot of Mordecai that night. And as chapter six opens, what do you hear about? The king can't sleep. I mean, you know, just like if you think about what what's the next thing that's going to happen that's in this just important narrative that's happening, it's that the king can't sleep. Of, of all the things to to play a factor in in the everything that's happened here with such huge things, it's this one sleepless night of the king that makes such a big turn within the narrative. Which again, I mean, I think from a just from a literary perspective, certainly makes us chuckle and, and appreciate, you know, just the story of it. From a theological perspective, it, it reminds us just how how involved God is with every single detail of our lives and the entire history of the world. That he he ends up bringing about deliverance for his people here, in part by a sleepless night for the king. I mean, just of all the things, that's yeah. what the Lord works through. It's remarkable. And, and you know, and, and hearing you kind of say it that way too, as we look at everything leading up to this point, you know, Mordecai and Esther, they have decided this is the faithful way to go. Here's what we need to do. Whether we die or not in the attempt, this is still what we have to be doing as faithful people of God, right? And uh, here it's in chapter six, it's like God is, he has, he's doing his part, right? He's, he's going in and saying, I'm going to be the one that directs the outcome here. Uh, my fa- people have been faithful. Uh, they're, you know, they know what they need to do. Um, I'm going to be the one that comes through and delivers them. Um, so, you know, the, they're doing their part, but God is going to be the one that is the actor that brings it to where it needs to go. Um, and, and I think that's kind of a beautiful way as we think about our life as Christians living in, you know, kind of a post-Christian world and things like that. We will, we will be faithful people of God regardless of the outcome, right? We need to stand, our, stand our, on our convictions and our faith, what has been given to us by our Lord, um, and march forward with that. And knowing that the Lord is going to bring us to the desired outcome 
um, because he is faithful and he is the one that is Lord. Um, so it, you know, we see a lot of connection here with what we can say in our life as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you were saying earlier, so again, where, where we are, not knowing exactly what God may or may not be up to, if this is one of those big moments where he's at work or a small moment where he's at work, uh, you know, it seems to us as small at least, in either case, we can be faithful. Just thinking about, again, this very simple moment that the Lord makes use of to direct his, his purposes here in the book of Esther invites us at those very small moments as well. How, do, how can I be faithful? And although you know, King Xerxes here is, is not acting as a Christian, just as you pointed out in the Psalms, there are often sleepless nights. How do we live in faithfulness when we're sleepless? And thinking through the Psalms, when you were talking about just the word sleepless, uh, brings to mind a hymn for me, one of the, the evening hymns that sometimes we get to, to sing if you have a, an evening worship service or maybe use this for devotions at home. It's number 883 in Lutheran service book, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night. Uh, num- verse stanza five uh, goes like this, When in the night I sleepless lie, my soul with heavenly thoughts supply. Let no ill dreams disturb my rest, no powers of darkness me molest. So even that sleepless mm-hmm. moment for us as Christians uh, is a very simple thing, but becomes a moment in which we cry out to God in, in prayer, uh, maybe using the words of that hymn or one of the Psalms. So again, uh, although that's maybe a, a bit of a tangent from the text, an encouragement for us in the small moments to seek after faithfulness toward God, even as, as we do in the big moments. Amen. I like that. Good. Okay, so so the Lord's going to make use of a sleepless night of King Xerxes, as you said. It, it is it's somewhat, uh, I don't know, comical. Maybe this is just the way the English translation goes, but it's the book of memorable deeds, uh, <laughs> and, and yet we're going to find out about a forgotten deed. There's a bit yeah. of a, a irony there, uh, so memorable deeds, and also perhaps it's a bit of irony, a memorable a book of memorable deeds, which the king may be using to help him fall asleep, okay? Right. So, so, some light reading material here in the middle of the night when he can't he can't sleep. Uh, someone reads it to him. I, I'm not sure who that that servant might have been. It's perhaps not the the top servant in the king's household, but he's, he's going to read it to him. And and lo and behold, what is read again? Where where is the book opened to? But it's found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. This was a, a detail that was recorded back in Esther chapter 2 that at the time were perhaps wondering, well, why do I need to know that about Mordecai? Here's where the detail comes back. Again, here you, you again start to see pieces fall into place from an unnamed actor, which we know who is the Lord, and this now peaks... Xerxes' attention, it seems, in the middle of the night. Uh, talk to us about what's going on here in, in verses 2 and 3. Yeah, so, you know, the, as you said, the memorable book is brought in. He's reading it as he's, he's listening. He hears of a, the, the recent plot against his life and how Mordecai had discovered the plot and prevented it and saved the king's life. And, you know, so this first thing, he's having trouble sleeping and he wakes up and he has this being read to him. And this is kind of the first thing that's on his mind then, right? This is kind of the first thought. And when you're a king in the Bible, um, usually the first thought of the day that you have is something that needs to get done. Um, you know, the king kind of orders himself that way. We see that a lot, you know, with either Pharaoh or in the book of Daniel. Um, the, the king, when he's troubled by something and something comes to mind, he's going to get it done. Um, and so here he's, you know, he's asked then, he hears the plot, and he's like, hey, what, what was done for him about this? Yeah, what, was, what was given to him? And then he hears, of course, well, nothing has been done. And that's going to maybe even trouble him some more, right? Someone who saved his life and he didn't do something as a king to reward that person. Um, you know, King uh, Ahasuerus here, you know, Xerxes, he, he's been really concerned about making sure things have been done by the book, right? Earlier in the book when Vashti uh, says no to coming to his feast, right? His advisor is kind of, well, if, if she does this, all the other women are going to act this way. So he, he acts in accordance to make sure everything's well done. So if he doesn't, perhaps in his mind then, or if he doesn't reward this person who saved his life, well, what's going to make other people want to save his life if they're not rewarded for it, right? So he's perhaps going to be a little bit concerned about this. Um, so this is kind of deeply on his mind. It's perhaps troubling him some more. And that's going to lead into the next kind of a coincidence, ironic moment in the book that's going to happen here. Um, But yeah, so right now at this point, nothing has been done. And then the narrator is going to kind of pause at this point, right? So it's not like all of a sudden he gets his, he's like, here's what I'm going to do. And then he has his thought here. 
um, it's almost the Lord sets the next, next piece in play, right? That humiliation of Haman here um, has to be accomplished. And so the Lord is going to bring about, Haman's going to be the one who solves the dilemma for the king here right off the bat here in chapter 6. Yeah, that's right. Just a, 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 to, again, notice how in the small details, the Lord works these large things that he's doing. So, you know, here you've got King Ahasuerus, Xerxes, who's who's reading from this memorable book of deeds. And, and where does he go? It, it, I, I don't know. I find it somewhat humorous and, and maybe a bit telling that he's reading from events that have happened within his own reign. So there's maybe a bit of pride, arrogance here. Let me hear how wonderful a king I've been. <laughs> you know, so he, he, the Lord makes use of even that small detail. And the fact that he's reading from, again, the, the these Persian chronicles, presumably, uh, thinking about, you know, things that we see elsewhere in Scripture— it was the Lord at work through the re- the record of the the edict of Cyrus back in the book of Ezra that allowed for continued construction of the the temple mm. when there was opposition. So the Lord has made use of Persian records previously to accomplish good things for His people. Here again, we see the Lord working through the Persian library system and and the nice card catalog that must have been established, so that so that he is you know he's bringing these things to the mind of King Ahasuerus, so that something good is going to happen not only for Mordecai but ultimately for his people. So again, we see in these small details how the Lord is at work for the deliverance of his people. We're going to keep looking at that more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Andrew Belt this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, June 27th. We're studying Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 13 with Pastor Andrew Belt. He serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, prior to the break, we were talking about King Ahasuerus. He has been reading from the chronicles of his own deeds and has heard about the recent help that Mordecai provided him, saving him from the conspiracy against his life. He's found out that no honor or distinction has been given to Mordecai for this, and as you said, he probably wants to encourage people to save his life in the future, so he wants to bestow honor and distinction on someone who does so. When he finds out that nothing's been done, he doesn't take action himself, but he wants to find out who's there that might advise him. So that brings us to verse 4 in the text. Take us in there. Yeah, we find out in the text that someone else is not having a uh, rather sleepful night either. Someone yeah. is struggling to sleep, and, and they also want to seek counsel and, and seek a resolution. And so they come to the king, and lo and behold, we find out when the king asks, who's out there in the court, right? He's thinking, who can advise him here? Well, it's Haman who's also coming to the court, and he's looking to kill Mordecai. And, yeah. you know, here the pieces are coming together for us. You know, we're kind of sitting here watching this unfold. The king wants to do something good for Mordecai. And Haman's coming in, and he wants to do something bad for Mordecai. Um, adding this all up, right, we see how the Lord is at work here. Um, and we know how it's going to go, right? He's the king. The king's going to get what he wants. Haman is, he's not going to be, it's almost like Haman's going to be blocked from being able to enact his plan and his desires here. Um, because the king has been put in mind to do something good for Mordecai when Haman wants to do evil to him. Um, and this, you know, I did mention here at the beginning of our segment, you know, Haman and Mordecai, there's perhaps some blood that goes back right. some ways here. When we hear their, um, their family lineages here, it, it might be suggested that Mordecai comes from the line of Saul. Um, 
And we have uh, Haman here, who is an Agite, an Amalekite. And during the days of Saul uh, in the Old Testament of 1 Samuel, uh, Saul and the Amalekites were always kind of butting heads. They were kind of like ancient enemies. And um, of course, Saul gets in trouble because of this too. So it's almost kind of like Mordecai is, uh, you know, undoing the tragic history of King Saul in a sense too, um, by his faithful being delivered too. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, another reversal here in the book of Esther that is another delight. It's another layer there that we can peel back and just be like, look at the Lord, how he is uh, pushing events forward in his own way um, and accomplishing the salvation of his people. So that's just a, a delight here. But back in the text, right, we have, uh, you know, Mordecai, the fate of Mordecai is up in the air, right? And how is it going to come down? Um, and it's wonderful how the Lord has set this all up to bring it to this point um, as we see Haman being now brought in uh, to answer a question for the king. So with Haman being sleepless, which, you know, it doesn't say that specifically in the text, but it certainly seems like a, a, a thing to, to think about, given his attitude in the previous chapter, how he said he has no joy while Mordecai's there and the council get this done quickly. Him being sleepless then, with us talking earlier about, you know, well, how do we as Christians respond faithfully in a moment of sleeplessness? Here, and, and, and we think about Xerxes maybe just sort of being a little more indifferent as a character. Haman, in his sleeplessness, however, probably provides us a bit of a, a, a warning as to how not to act in a moment of sleeplessness. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of the Psalms depict people who are wicked, evil. They plot the evil on their beds, right? They, they, all they can think about is how to achieve their wickedness. And uh, so Mordecai here is playing into many of the Psalms that depict how evil people respond to sleepless nights. Um, he's restless to accomplish it, right? And so he, he can't think, as soon as he can get up and get going and get to the king, um, he is there. And you know, it suggests that when the king asks who's in the court, that Haman at this point in time is the only one in the court, right? Which suggests a very early, early morning um, sure. uh, sleeplessness here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I mean, so Haman has been sleepless and in his sleeplessness, he comes seeking revenge. Xerxes has been sleepless. In his sleeplessness, he's had his own acts read to him and has heard about Mordecai, whom he needs to honor. And so you know, you've got these two sleepless men, uh, one of whom is going to ask for advice for the other, uh, which is coming in verse, oh, that's, let's see, where's verse 6, right? So uh, verses 5 tell us, you know, the situation. Haman's there because he wants the king to allow Mordecai to be executed on the gallows prepared. The king's young men tell the king, here's Haman. And so Haman is brought in, and the king asks a question. What should be done to the man whom the king delights <laughs> to honor? And and here we see Haman's pride uh, get the best of him. Yes, it does. You know, he he's thinking to himself, that's me, right? He, what a kind of a, you know, pride comes before the fall here. Yeah. And here is a, a perfect illustration of that. Uh, the king wants to honor someone. He doesn't tell us who, right? We're kept in that. We know who. So the suspense here is just, it's dripping. And uh, Haman, he's sitting there and he makes the this, this stumble part of the whole book here. Um, he thinks, well, that must be me. So what would I like the king to do to me? Um, and so he's setting forth in motion here the exaltation of Mordecai and also then for the rest of the Jews in the book, um, the salvation. And so it is from the hand of the enemy that God is going to bring forth salvation. And from this, you, know, you see Jesus, right? From the hand of the enemy, the one who gave death to our Lord, the one who did evil and violence and hatred and, and put him to death, right? Put him on the gallows. Um, from this, the Lord has been raised. He is risen. And he has also now conquered death. Um, and he bestows that gift. He, as he is exalted, he now gives that gift to us. So, we should see in a picture of Mordecai, a picture of our Lord Jesus, right? He's a, Mordecai is a, a, the Christ-like figure um, in the Old Testament book here. You could say maybe Esther is the church here, you know, and, and, and mm. plotting out that. And that's just a beautiful way as we kind of frame that, you know, kind of take that allegory method there. But it, I think it works because you see it just playing out. Um, and it's faithful to how the text shows us what it, what it is to be God's people. Um, but it's just beautiful here how God is turning the tables and the victory comes from the hand of the enemy. So the Lord uses the enemy to achieve salvation for his people. And it's just, you can't get better than that. 
So talk talk more about that reality that the Lord makes use even of the plotting of his enemies, the enemies of his church to accomplish his purposes. I mean, I think that's a theme you see in the Psalms, in the prayers of the Psalms. And again, you see it play out narratively here and in many, many ways, even in, again, the way that our Lord Jesus uh, wins our salvation, that the Lord makes use of the plotting of of his own enemies to accomplish his good purposes. Just talk more about that reality in, in the scriptures. It, you know, it shows us that evil is subject to the Lord, right? It's not beyond him. It's subject to his control that the Lord is Lord even of evil. I, I Was it Luther's line there that the, the devil is God's devil? Yeah. Um, and God makes use of him, right? It, it's not like the devil's like, oh, how can I serve the Lord today, right? But it's rather that the devil falls into the very trap um, that he sets up for his people. And the Lord is able to use that to bring about deliverance. And it shows us the Lord's control. Um, that he's the ma- And it causes us then to see, here's a Lord that can undo evil. Uh, and that can use evil to accomplish that. And just how much we can put ourselves in the care and the love of our God, knowing that he can do this. Um, I think this really builds faith. This builds trust, knowing that evil is not going to one-up on us or one up on our Lord. It tries, right? It wants to try to do that, but it always finds itself being subject to the Lord regardless. Um, so we can entrust ourselves to a faithful creator even when we're suffering. I do believe that's Peter that puts it that way. Um, and that's a wonderful way to, as we encounter life, as we live in this world, we don't have to worry about evil running amok, right? It's something that we should be faithful and fight against and resist, but we should never be afraid that it's something that's going to always overcome us. Um, and even if it does bring forth death, well, the Lord is going to raise us. Um, right. So we can be confident in that. So I, I love that this book really can kind of connect us to so many other themes in the scriptures. And we can see how the Lord can work through salvation for his people, even using evil to accomplish it. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit more about Haman then as a negative example in this regard, the negative example of his pride just blinding him to what's going on. <clears throat> now, to be fair, I, I mean, I suppose as Haman has, has looked at his situation thus far, he does see himself having been honored in a number of ways recently, so that his his assumption is not entirely out of place, but it does seem that his pride allows him to, to make that assumption and then run without run with it without any sort of self-examination that that would be prudent for for any person. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit more about about his pride, the way that it blinds him. Uh, my my mind is is running to uh, a verse that we've recently studied here as a part of our adult Bible study from Matthew's gospel where Jesus says the one who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. And we, we noted in reading that verse that the, the passive there, although the actor isn't mentioned, that the one who, who does the humbling to the, to the exalted one, that's God. And I, I think, again, you see Haman as an example of that here. So talk a little bit about the, the negative example of pride. Yeah. You know, evil always self-destructs, right? Uh, as you mentioned, pride is blinding. And it's blinding Haman here. You know, it's it's perhaps almost that the Lord has given him the Haman this initial success to kind of bring him to this moment where that pride now he's all in, right? He is sold on this. Any reservation um, is now dropped, right? Uh, it, when it, before the king, right, I, you'd always want to be careful to assume this is you or not, um, and, and take uh, you know prudence is needed here. But because of that earlier success, Haman's like. Well, who else would it possibly be but me? I'm the closest one to the king. I, I get to come to him in the early morning here. What else would he want me here for? Um, so right, this assumption, right, to assume that this is how it's going to go is going to be blinding of him. Um, and which is funny, as we sit back and watch this, it's almost like a lesson for us to not assume things. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, as we see this self-destruction for Haman here, um, it causes us to come forward in humility, as you mentioned the verse from Jesus, right? To not want to exalt ourselves, but rather to trust ourselves to God and to allow God in his proper time to act. It's almost like pride wants to act on its own terms and not let the Lord do his thing. Um, and that's the dangerous thing, right? That kind of self kind of autonomy. I, I'm going to be the one that achieves this. I'm going to be the one that gets this done. Um, it, it, it perhaps even plays into the theme that God has been absent, you know, I'll say that in the quotations there um, right. in the book, that 
we need to be careful that he is present. He is with us. Um, I am with you always until the end of the age. And so that causes us then to not go forward with a, a, a proud and, and a self-confidence, but rather a confidence in the Lord despite present circumstances. I think that's perhaps the best way to kind of go about it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So Haman in his blinding pride, assuming that the king wants to honor him, has some wonderful suggestions as, as to how the king might do that. Again, thinking all this is going to happen to him, what does Haman suggest? He pictures glory, doesn't he? He what is the best way to honor himself in such a public manner that you know it sets in stone how people are going to look at him, right? It's it's almost like his he's picturing his triumph here, and uh, the triumph that he pictures is is getting to sit on a horse that the king himself has sat on, right? And you don't do that; you don't get to sit on the king's horse. Um, he, dressed in a, one of the king's robes that he has worn, right? And, and dressed in a, a crown that the king himself has worn, right? It's almost like he's a, a mini king and, uh, you know, it's, and crown of glory and honor, we would say, and then get ridden through town and to be, have someone go forward and say, this is what will happen to the, the one whom the king wants to honor, right? It's, well, it's, you don't get any more showboaty or glorious or grandiose than this. And, and Haman, he's like, this is going to be great. What, what better way to celebrate my triumph and, and to get some rest that Mordecai is going to be put to death. And, oh, this is going to be a good day here. It's, it's <laughs> oh, tragically it's, it, funny. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because, again, Haman has already, we, we've heard Haman's thoughts that, that he is assuming that these things are going to happen for him. And so he says, this is what I want done to me, is essentially what he's telling the king. He doesn't say it with those words, but this is what he's saying. I want this done to me. And then the twist comes in verse 10, where the king actually reveals what he's thinking. <laughs> Take us into the twist. Yeah, the twist. So here's Haman. You, you can almost think of his, mind, his face glowing, right? Just just waiting to hear what the king's got to say. And then I you know, just have to read the verse there again because it is just great. He says, Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, you know, so get done now. Um, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew. And you almost got to, you wish you were in the court of the king in this moment, right? Just to be the fly on the wall. And to just see, oh, you know, the, but yet he has to kind of keep his composure because he's in the presence of the king. He, he can't reveal his cards now. And so it's almost like he's stuck. Right. And you, but you just got to wonder what was going on as his face just yeah. probably just dropped. Um, and do it to the Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate and leave out nothing that you have met. So just, you know, to twist the knife a little bit for Haman, everything that you have said, make sure you don't leave out a single thing about that. Yeah. Um, and, and then it gets even funnier and more tragic for Haman here um, because not only he had thought of a servant going ahead of Mordecai and doing this, uh, but who is the servant that gets to go ahead of Mordecai to proclaim this? Well, Haman himself. Uh, see, almost the words coming out of his mouth, he has to praise Mordecai, but inwardly he just, oh, it just he can't stand this. Um, and further, just you know, talk about a Philippians 2 moment, right? That the Lord Jesus Christ... Mm-hmm who has been humbled and exalted, and who will confess him as Lord, right? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. Um, we'll, we'll confess Jesus this way. Um, and so, right, the, the, even the devil will give praise and honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. It, he, he will despise it, right? He'll say it through his, his forked tongue there. Um, but he will give glory. And here Haman will give glory to Mordecai, though he desires his death. Um, it, it's beautiful. It, this, is, this is gold. Right? You, you can't get better yeah. than this in, in tragic reversals. And, and, or in this case, you know, for Mordecai, this is a happy reversal. Um, right. And this kind of sets up, as we think again, too, this is going to be our happy reversal. Mm. Right? Our enemy who seeks our death, the devil and all of that, um, is going to be undone. Right? Death will be undone one day. There will be more, no more crying or tears because death will be put away. The old order of things put away. Um, and it's, it's just glorious how this all works out for us in the life of Christ and what we have to look forward to here. So we can see just a mirror um, here reflecting our Lord Jesus primarily, but also being extended to us um, yeah. as well. And this is what the scriptures teach us. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as you said, that, that then gives us the encouragement to live faithfully 
knowing that in the end we will be vindicated. That's the way, again, the Psalms often speak about this, that the Lord will vindicate the righteous. That's the hope of, of God's people that allows us to live faithfully in the midst of, of persecution and suffering, knowing that we're, quote, on the right side. We, we are with the Lord. He has won the victory already in the Lord Jesus Christ and will deliver that victory in its fullness to us on the last day. It just uh, it, it kind of struck me just briefly uh, hearing these words from the the lips of King Ahasuerus in all this. You know, you kind of wonder he seems either he's he's saying this with a wry grin on his own face cuz he realizes or he's just a little clueless. Yeah. Because you know, you think back to Esther chapter 3, I mean, the king knows what he decreed and what he's allowed Haman to do for the very people that Mordecai is, or he said, Mordecai the Jew. I mean, has the king forgotten what happened in Esther chapter 3? Mm. Maybe that wasn't part of the reading. He, he, I think he comes off a little clueless here, which, and the reason I point that out is not to make fun of him, but to, to highlight all the more the reality that God is at work behind the scenes. Yeah. This isn't, I don't think, this isn't King Ahasuerus trying to get Haman, because he knows he's a little prideful, and he's going to kind of show him with a, a wry grin on his face. Rather, King Ahasuerus just is, doesn't realize what's going on. This is really, you know, he's just kind of a little clueless, but the Lord is the one. He's the real yeah. king behind all of it. So. Yeah, it, it's almost like King Ahasuerus here is, he's just along for the ride almost. Yeah, um, yeah. He's not the primary actor in the book. In fact, he's always responding to things. Yeah. Um, he's not the one setting anything up. It's almost like there's all these plots happening around him, whether it's his guards that want to seek his life or, or Haman plotting to, for his own glory, um, or even Mordecai and, and Esther, they're plotting too to, you know, for salvation. And it seems you know, the Lord is granting success and he's always working it out for his people. Um, the king's just kind of, as you say, kind of bumbling along almost, yeah, uh, right. and it's, which kind of adds to the comedy as well to it. Yes, yeah, and again, I think the the aspect of divine providence as well. That who's who's really king, even here in Persia, yeah. it's it's still very much the Lord. So, okay, Haman now has has led Mordecai around town, just in the way that he envisioned for himself. He's proclaiming, "This is what happens for the man the king delights to honor." Uh, you know, the primary actors in this chapter again are are Haman and the king. However, you do have this brief note in verse twelve that I, I find significant. That Mordecai, after having this honor done to him, what does he do? He returns to the king's gate. So he does mm. not fall into the trap of pride uh, that Haman had. It seems he's going to continue to live faithfully, even with this great honor that's been bestowed upon him. He doesn't seek to rub it in anybody's faces. He just goes back to his daily vocation. He he sings a hymn of the Ten Commandments and goes off to his work, <laughs> as Luther says in the, the morning prayer section of the Catechism. That's Mordecai. However, Haman has the reaction I think we'd probably expect. Uh, you make any comments on Mordecai's actions there and then take us into to what Haman does in response. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that's beautiful kind of describe Mordecai that way. He's humble, right? He, he doesn't assume things. Where Haman has been trying to assume things for himself and has been acting in his pride, um, instead of that, we have Mordecai who, the honor just happens to him, right? And he takes it, but he doesn't let that go to his head either. Now, all of a sudden, he's not an, an actor or trying to get what's coming either. He goes right back to what he has been doing this whole time in this book. Um, and we'll, we'll see kind of Mordecai's exaltation at the end of the book further. Um, but here we get a little bit of a foretaste, right? What happened to Mordecai is a foretaste of what's going to happen in the rest of the book. It's almost at this point we're like, you know, this is going to work out fine now. Um, yeah. If this is what's happened to Mordecai, this is, the king's not going to let this happen now to Esther or to the rest of the Jews in the empire. Um, he will, he will, the people will be saved. So it's already at this point we're kind of in like a, well, whew, right? That looked kind of scary for a moment. Yeah. Um, but we're, there's almost like the light is beginning to dawn now. And mm -hmm. you know, for us in Christ, right, the light is already dawning. Um, and we're entering into this new age. But you know, it, talk about once again that this hammer this point home that what has happened here, Esther and Mordecai's plan hasn't really come to fruition yet, right? They they're already they plan to do it, but nothing on their end has happened yet. Rather, it's God has planned this all out, and He's already achieved the victory, right? It's almost like uh, what's gonna what Mordecai and Esther are gonna do is almost kind of the icing on the cake. Um, it, it's adding nothing substantial to what has already now happened, um, as you say that the Lord has already achieved the victory here. Yeah. So just kind of beautiful. Uh, but yeah, as you kind of note, right? Mordecai goes back home, uh, back to the gate, but uh, Haman here he he rushes back home, 
and uh, he has some bad news to tell to his family. It's it's kind of interesting how his his wife and his his wise men are, as it said here, right. are kind of brought up because it almost talk about people who are just kind of reacting to things too. It's almost like Haman's like, I'm going to do this, and they're like, Oh yeah, that sounds like a great plan. And then Haman's going to come back here and be like, Oh, it didn't work, and like, Well, looks like you lost. Um, That's right. You know, it's it's almost like they're these counselors are not really counselors either. Um, yeah. You can think of um, David in, in 2 Samuel, right? Whose son Absalom rebels against him. And uh, it was ah- Ahithophel, um, yeah. who's a really, the really wise counselor, but he falls into his own bad counsel um, from Hushai. You, know, you just see this kind of a lot in the scriptures that these counselors, you can't rely on man, right? The, you must rely upon the Lord God. Um, and what's the Lord God all about? The saving and defending his people whom he has called and chosen and redeemed and saved and sanctified, all of that. Um, and so we see that it's just these subtle hints in the book, and they really just all add up to that. Um, but yeah, so they all, you know, they tell, he, Haman tells the family and the friends and the wise men and all this what's happened. And, you know, that kind of leads into the final verse then in our section for today. And they're like, well, dude, it's, it's done. Um, yeah. if, if you're already falling against this guy, it's over, right? It's, you, you might as well count yourself dead already. Um, yeah, you won't it succeed. Is, it's, it is a bit, it's quite a turn, I think, from the end of chapter five to the end of chapter six with these same people, you know, the wife and the counselors, or the, the wife and the friends, that, that at the end of chapter five, they, they seem very hopeful that, yeah, go for it. You know, here's what you need to do and, and you're going to win. And by, and, and maybe almost like, and, and we're with you. And now at the end of chapter six, here the same people. Well, you lost. Have fun with that. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, like there's there's no there's no sort of solidarity it seems anymore. That, that that's over and done. And again, I think you're you're exactly right to to point out at this point we know where the story's headed. We know what's going to happen, and it's been accomplished again through these just very simple things that God has accomplished in the background. Such that what happens now with Esther and Mordecai going forward, it's not their own plotting or doing, but this has always been the Lord at work. And I really do think that this chapter helps to, to show that. You know, we've talked at, at several points in this chapter about moments that are, are indicative of other places in Scripture. And I think what we have here in this recognition of, of that, well, you've lost, and even though they haven't lost, it hasn't played out, you see that elsewhere in the Scriptures. When the, when the Egyptian army is chasing after Israel through the Red Sea, before the sea comes in on them, they realize we're in trouble because the Lord is fighting for Israel, and he's fighting against us. And again, even though you don't have that explicit mention here that, hey, Haman, you've lost because God's fighting against you, you don't have that explicit mention. Again, places like that and and other places where you see that same realization I think, invite us once again to see the hand of the Lord at work. Haman has lost already, and not because Mordecai's been so strong, but because the Lord has been at work all along to deliver his people. We've got about two minutes left, Pastor Belt, to wrap things up this morning. You know, this reminds me, too, of also in the, the book of the Kings, right, that God goes and puts a lying spirit in his the counselors of the kings so that they will believe the lie and fall through with it. And you kind of see that a little bit here. Maybe... Uh, Haman's counselors were given a, a lying spirit to have him go through the gallows because the Lord's going to trap him. Um, we see here that throughout the scripture, God's enemies always fall by their own counsels. Um, they, their own plans that they set up, they fall into their own traps. And as God's people, knowing, seeing this in our Lord Jesus Christ and the, the trap that he fell into on the cross, right? that he has come out, he has been raised, he's been vindicated, and we are his people. Right? We are the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has called. And it's amazing, when you, know, when you read the book of Acts, just how much Paul and Peter and Stephen, they sound like Jesus, their life starts looking like Jesus. And so we see that a lot of these same things that happen to Jesus happen to his people. Paul in Romans 6, right? We've been baptized with the Christ. That means we've been crucified with him, buried with him, and raised with him. So as a Christian, right, we see the pattern that God has set apart in our life and that this is the, the path that we follow. Um, our, we, lead our, we follow our good shepherd through that valley of the shadow of death, and we come out on the other side, raised and resurrected through the Red Sea into a new promised land. Um, and that's the path that the Lord has. And we see that carried out in the book of Esther here. And we can give thanks to God as we look upon our life, living in a, under a, an, our own kind of Persia, um, in our own kind of exile, 
knowing that the Lord will also, he is the one in charge. He's the one on the throne and he is the one putting together pieces and leading us to the desired outcome of the new creation and the life of the world to come. And thanks be to God. Pastor Andrew Belt serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. He's been helping us today to study Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Pastor Belt, thanks for being our guest today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Esther 6, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us tomorrow morning as we jump into Esther chapter 7 to see how the Lord works out deliverance for his people still through the work of now Esther inviting Haman and the king to her banquet. Thanks for spending the morning with today. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.